It is Wednesday. Sorry. It is Wednesday afternoon, February 8th. We will be picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 16 and verse 7 is when we go through word by word. Just a quick review. We're looking at the chapter following a, a time when Avram walked strongly in his faith and was a good example. In chapter 16, we see that he is a human example. We're encouraged by that because we too in our humanity don't stay on that level of being strong in the Lord like we want to be all the time, but we're thankful as the Lord brought Avraham through, he will bring us through also. So when we start out in verse 1 of chapter 16, we see that Sarai and Avraham are two very discouraged people about the promise, about looking for that son to come. They're getting old in age and Sarai begins to think and we, we can justify it and say she might have even thought, well, God promised my husband. He didn't say it'd be through me. We got to do something about this. We know that that is so easy for we as human beings to be impatient because to us, you know, every day is ticking. It's a long day. Sometimes the minutes tick very loudly and very long. And to God, a thousand years is as a day. He's not impatient and his timing is not too long. He's not delaying. His timing is perfect. Seldom early, never late, always on time. <clears throat> but Sarai says, you better do something about it. Avram, I've got my handmaid. This was culture in that day. The handmaid could be given to the husband. If she had a child, the child would be considered the child of the wife. The wife would, you know, have the, the um, would, would in essence bring that one in like her very own as if she had given birth. So he, Sarai wants her house to be built up. She wants to have progeny. She wants to have those who will remember her when she is gone. She wants to uh, be full in that. And so she tells Avram to take Hagar, her handmaid. This is the one that she picked up most likely in Egypt because Hagar is Egyptian and we don't know any other way or time she would have entered into this picture. Remember when they were down in Egypt, it was not because they were following and trusting the Lord. They'd gone down because of famine into the land. Again, taking things into their own hands, it looks like. And out of it comes a bit more trouble. And that trouble has the name of Hagar. Avraham listens to his wife. They have relations, and before you know it, Hagar is pregnant. Uh, in the time of pregnancy, even before Ishmael is born, we see that it puts more of a rife, more of a division, more of a headache and a heartache into the very tent of Avraham. Sarai and Hagar did not have a good relationship. It's to the max now. Hagar probably was flaunting it in front of Sarai because now it's really raised her status even though she's slave. She's, you know, got this connection with this very wealthy, prominent man about town. I'm saying in quotes town. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it make her look pretty good. It, it was considered that there's something wrong if you're not able to have children. So Sarai, Sarai has something, you know, that's God's not blessing her, and here comes Hagar, and now, you know, she's got the eye of, of Sarai's husband. You know, you can imagine, you can read between the lines, it was not a happy home. You're never going to find a happy home when you have the world married into your home, and I, I don't mean married literally, but you know what I'm saying. So, uh, we find, i got to think how far, because I've read ahead and studied ahead. Um, okay, we find that Sarai gets that up and she turns to Avram and she lashes out at him. It's his fault, even though it was her idea, <laughs> but he did it, you know, and now he needs to do something about it. And Avraham, being a, a fine, upright, perfect human example, does the same thing and shoots <laughs> back and says, well, you got yourself in this mess. Do something to get yourself out of it. <laughs> passing the buck, passing the blame, and not taking responsibility. Yes? What does it mean when you say, made the wrong done to me? Sarai is saying, I've been wronged. You need to deal with that, Avram. Oh. That's what she's saying. And Avram is saying, all right, she's your handmaid. Deal with it. Do whatever. Deal with it. Now, he shouldn't have done that because his responsibility was to take charge in his home. And he should have looked for a way to solve the friction in the home. But instead, he's passing the buck. And he's going to let her go ahead and rise up in more power 
and you've already got Hagar flaunting it at Sarai, and now Sarai is really free to do whatsoever, and she deals very harshly or hardly. Um, as the Hebrew says in verse 6, she oppressed Hagar. Um, she is so upset that she's lashing back now in a way that now Hagar, if she was feeling pretty happy and pretty good and pretty confident, now her life's pretty miserable, in fact, to the degree that she decides, <laughs> best thing for me is get out of Dodge. So she heads out, I believe she's heading down to Egypt, to her home. She's probably thinking, I've had it, I've had enough of this, I'm not sticking around for this, and she takes off. She's uh, seeking to be rid of her trial. She's striking out against her circumstances. We don't hear that she accepts these are her circumstances. That's very hard for us to do as human beings today, to accept our circumstances, and then look to God to bring the good out of it, to, to uh, be brought through it. We don't see her turn that way. But at the same time, we have to remember Hagar, it was not her fault either. You know, this was not her choice. She was told she had to do, she was in that slave position. So she flees. And that was our, um, verse 6 was Avram telling Sarai, look, the, the slave woman is in your power. Do what's good in your sight. Sarai tre treats her harshly, and Hagar is the one who fled from her presence. So what happens to Hagar now? She's run out. Remember, we're in the desert area, okay? We're not in a city. She didn't go stay in a hotel. She didn't find a cushy place to stay. <laughs> She's out in the environment now, and we have something very interesting happen. In verse 7, it starts with, Now the angel of the Lord found her. It doesn't mean that he was looking where where's my lost soul hagar hagar <laughs> it's not that he's looking for her but he comes to her where she is i love that god knows where we are and he will come to us we need to be open and hearing but he will come to us now the angel of the lord is the one who found her who came to where she is and she is by a spring of water. I did put her in the desert, but there is water. She's not dying of thirst, and she's just gone out. But we have an appearance. When we have this, we need to stop and look and see what we're being told. The angel of the Lord is, um, well, without wanting to give you a full answer for a moment, because I want us to be thinking and developing, let me say this. We're going to look on the flip side of this. I'm going to tell a little bit more. And then we're going to look and we're going to see other places in Scripture where the angel of the Lord appeared. This is the first time we're told this. So the first time we see it is with Hagar. But we'll see it with Abraham. We'll see it with Yaakov, Jacob. We'll see the angel of the Lord speaking to Samson's parents, wrestling with Jacob. We will see the angel of the Lord um, redeeming Yaakov, Jacob, speaking to Moshe, Moses from the burning bush, protecting Israel at the time of the parting of the Red Sea, preparing Israel for the promised land. We'll see several times in several ways that's referred to. The angel of the Lord commissions Gideon. He was the one that was hiding, trying to winnow his crop and hiding from the enemy, and God commissioned him to be captain of his army and go into war. We'll see the angel of the Lord ministering to Eliyahu, to Elijah. We'll see the, the angel of the Lord reassuring Yeshua, Joshua, at the time of his first major battle into the promised land. We'll see the angel of the Lord saves Yerushalayim. And we'll even see the angel of the Lord preserve the three men in the fiery furnace. That's Daniel chapter 3. I'm not going to go into detail on all of these. I'm going to give you highlights when we get to them. But I just want you to see that, that there are many times the angel of the Lord is mentioned in the scripture. In fact, in the original covenant, we have 39 different occurrences. This being just our first here in, in uh, Hagar, Hagar's life. <coughs> he appears to Balaam. He appears... During the time of the judges, he appears to Israel collectively, to Melch David, King David. Um, I could go on, but I think I've given you enough examples to see this is an important character of Scripture. When we see this repeated in different circumstances, but this many times, I want to know who this is. I want a little more insight because this is a mighty acting... Okay. 
I'm going to tip my hand sooner or later who I believe. <laughs> but this, this is mighty, and this is mighty important. Let me put it that way. So let's look at the angel of the Lord before we uh, get any further in our story. I, I'll just tell you, she, he's going to appear to her. He's going to deal with her situation, and he's going to tell her something prophetically, okay? Let's look. Let me, let me just drop on you what the question is. There are two ideas out there who the angel of the Lord is. One says, because it says it's an angel, it's not the Lord. That is someone other than the Lord. The other says, this is the Lord in what's called a theophany. A theophany is an appearance of God in a form, a human form, or, or an, I'm sorry, an angelic form, not human, an angelic form, but this happens before the pre-incarnation of Yeshua Jesus, of the second part of the Godhead, the Son of, of God, taking on human form and um, coming into the picture in that form. So is this just an angel, a very important angel, an angel who's on, um, on, on, oh, what's the word I want? On um, duty, you know, been given a task. There's a word for that. Um, and, oh goodness okay Lord help me use my brain and think what I'm trying to say like an appointment? yeah on appointment but we don't say it that way what do we say on it's not on duty it's not on appointment on on, task? you've got the idea I'm still fighting for the word when it pops in I'll tell you <laughs> unmute Rhonda she's got it unmute Rhonda assignment on assignment. Yeah. Thank you. I could tell you were all lit up. I knew you had it. Okay. Is this an angel, a very important angel on assignment? Or is this the Lord himself? That's what the question is. And when we look at what happens, it begins to help us have the answer. So let's look real quickly at who is the angel of the Lord? God himself or an angel of God? Okay. Can he take the appearance of an angel? Doris says, can't he take the appearance of an angel? A very good question. He's God, he can do anything. <laughs> and Patty's got a great answer. He's God, he can do anything. <laughs> True, so if I were to answer you directly, I would say you two both are leaning to the fact that angel Lord is the Lord himself, appearing in angelic form. <clears throat> Those who are going to oppose are going to say, no, 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 then it should just say it's the Lord, it shouldn't say an angel of the Lord. And there's your controversy. So. <clears throat> Let's look at what the scripture tells us. An angel is a messenger sent from God. The word in Hebrew is malak. It would be kind of spelled M-A-L uh, apostrophe A-K. That's, that's pretty close. You'll find it spelled a number of different ways, but malak. Okay? Now, Yeshua himself, Jesus himself, says that he was sent from the Father. Okay? That's Yochanan John 8.18. I am the one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So Yeshua, in claiming deity, claims that he is a messenger sent by God. And as I've said 39 times, we find this phrase, and we have to decide every time we look at it, is this from Yahweh, from Yehovah? Is this the office of Yehovah? What are we looking at? Is it the Lord himself, or is it his sent one that's not himself? The context is what helps us understand. So we begin to look at what we're going to read about. If we see in that context that the one speaking has the attributes that belong to God and God alone, then it has to be God, hands down, just has to be. It would have to be a theophany then, an appearance of God in an angelic form. If the when speaking in our circumstances seems to be bringing a message from God and not exhibiting the attributes of God, then we have a chance for it to be just an angel, I say just in quotes, an angel, a messenger sent from God, which still would be a very important position, you know, nothing short of that either. If it is God himself, then I don't think that anyone argues with that usually and probably always is an appearance of the second 
the Son of God, the second part of the triunity, not God the Father, not God the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, but God the Son that's exhibiting in this form to mankind because that is the way that God relates to us. In other words, we know scripture tells us in, in Yochanan in John chapter 1 and verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him, the Father, known. So what Yeshua is saying in John 1, 18 there is nobody's seen God the Father. Nobody has. Instead, what they've seen is the one and only Son. Now the Son is God himself, and in the closest relationship you can have to the Father because he's a very part of the Father. He is the Father. They are the two or one and one or two. Yeah, explain that one. <laughs> and he, he has come to make the Father known. And we know that. Yeshua said, I've come to do the will of the Father. You know, he was telling that he was on assignment. Yet even being on that assignment, we know he still was fully God. So God can send the Son of God on assignment to reveal God to mankind. And we see that wrapped up in the personification of the one that we call Yeshua Jesus in his human form. Okay, so... All of that, if you're confused, let's just go ahead and look um, at the scriptures and see what I think will give us clarity of it. Let me just give you a huge hint because I want to make this easier on you. After Yeshua's incarnation, after he puts on human flesh, okay, incarnate is in the flesh. After God, the, God uh, comes into human form in the person of Yeshua Jesus we never have the angel of the Lord mentioned in scripture again seems like this is ended at this point so keeping that in mind tips my hand very much that the angel of the Lord is the Lord himself is him presenting before we see him in human form himself and then once he's in human form, we're not calling him the angel of the Lord because we're seeing him in human form as he continues on. Okay, that's just, I've tipped my hand now. First time here, Genesis 16, 10, we have the angel of the Lord speaking like it's God himself because we haven't done verse 10, but in verse 10, the angel Lord speaking says, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. Now, who has the right to speak like that? An angel? No, God, right? God's the only one that has the right to say, I'll give you progeny. I'll give you children. I'll give you so many children you can't count them because children are heritage from the Lord. Children come from God. They don't come from angels. Angels don't create children. God creates and God provides. So as we continue, we're going to see that the portrait of this figure is very much God, and yet at times he'll, he'll speak or show himself to be separate from God. Now if that confuses you, keep in mind who is Yeshua Jesus. He is God, and yet we see him separate from God. Remember how we've said, like in Revelation 1, and other places that you're looking at a description and you'll say oh that description is Jehovah that description is of God the Father I know scriptures that that's God the Father and then all of a sudden in the middle of that description you're gonna go uh oh now that's a description of God the Son that's a description of Yeshua <laughs> Jesus I know that from these scriptures that tell us this was Jesus so in one description you can see God the Father and God the Son. And again, when everybody says, but how can that be? It's because we cannot understand the triunity of our God. No matter how hard we try, we cannot. I can give you all the examples. I can give you the egg that has a shell and it has a yolk and it has the white and the three are one. I can tell you, you know, water, ice, and steam, three forms, all one. I can give you different examples, but I will tell you nothing will fully equal the example of God because even in those two that I just gave you, are all those three parts of the egg equal? No. Are they interchangeable? No. 
are they, what's what my other, there was another thought and it's gone. They fall short, okay? It gives us an idea, it gives us a glimpse. But there is a point where we just have to say that we do not understand how God is one and yet God is three. We know it from the Hebrew, from Echad, being a united God. We know it that it's not the word Yahid, which is singular. We know it in all these ways that we can conceptualize, but there's a point in time where we just have to say, I can't fully understand it. I think the closest we get is when we look at one person, and let's take a man because we look at God by the male. We see one man be a husband, a father, and a son, all three at the same time, but there are three different representations. I think that's the closest. Again, they're not all equal to God because he, when he was a husband, he had first <clears throat> been the son. <laughs> he, he wasn't a father till he had a child, so it came on him into those roles where God was always the three. Okay, so again, we're never going to fully comprehend, but we're going to see this complex being. There's just no other way to put it. He's complex. We're, we're going to see as we look at the angel of the Lord that the more we see through scripture, the more progressive revelation we're given. Oh, okay, I understand this from the time of Hagar. I understand this much more with Balaam. I understand even more by the time the angel of the Lord is appearing to David. And as we continue on, all the way, like I say, until we literally have God in human form, we understand more as it goes along. We'll see that God is unified. I just brought that, that he is a unity, but we also see him diverse. I also just brought that to you. He's the three in one, he's the one in three. We'll see that God is near. And we'll see at the same time, God is far from above, you know, far away from us, so to speak. And we'll see that the angel of the Lord manifests himself in Yeshua, and yet we'll see him diverse from Yeshua also. So it's not easy to fully understand, but I am going to say simply, the angel of the Lord to me is a physical appearance of our God. That that's fully what I believe, and it gives us great insight into how great our God is. What we have is a God who draws near to humanity in order to draw humanity near to God. Emmanuel, God with us. So that's why it's an amazing study to see. And when we realize and begin to see from that viewpoint, then we understand things like when we've, we've read and studied Yeshia, Isaiah 9, 6, and as a child is born and as the son is given, but in that is also something else interesting because let me take you to Malachi, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. And in that verse, God says, look, I am sending my messenger, my angel, okay, my messenger to clear the way before me. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Yes, the messenger of the covenant in whom you take such delight, look, here he comes, says... Adonai Sabaoth says the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the angels, the Lord of the armies is saying, look, I'm sending my messenger. There you see the separation. It would be like God saying, I'm sending the son. But then you suddenly see that the messenger that got sent is the son that's been promised by God and is God when he said he would come and be, be here in human form. We know in Isaiah 9, 6, he's given the name Wonderful, Wonder of it all. And we'll see that that ties in with the angel Lord appearing in just a little bit. So we've got the Lord of hosts, that's God, saying that he's sending his Moloch, his messenger, and then he's saying that the messenger is Messiah, is the coming one, is God. So you see how we... <laughs> We just have to realize God is greater than we can comprehend, greater than we can fully understand. So then the question is asked by those naysayers who don't want to agree with the viewpoint that I'm giving, well then, what about putting, why does the word angel get put in there? Isn't that demoting him? Because the angels are not God. They're not equal to God. 
maybe all this is telling us is that it's a mighty angel like Michael or, or Gabriel. Remember those two, Michael and Gabriel? Uh, even their names. Michael's name means, who is like my God? Nobody's like my God. And Gabriel, Gabriel means God's the strong man, my hero God. So when the scripture is speaking of the angels and we see them in lesser than the angel of the Lord, they again want to make this someone lesser. Um, when we look at the angels in scripture, we see hierarchy. We see archangels, we see seraphim, cherubim, we see different positions. The cherubim, the, the seraphim, they were guarding the holiness of God. They have great responsibility to, to be surrounding the, to, uh, the most holy place and so forth. Um, but we see archangels. Archangels are high up. They're over a state. One's over the state of Israel, the protector for Israel. That's Michael, Michael. He's the angel for Israel. So we see they're given huge areas and, and like that's his kingdom, okay? So the angels have great responsibility, but yet we know that the angel of the Lord, if he's the Lord himself, is above those angels. And um, look with me real quick at Hebrews. Hebrews 1 helps give us a little insight into this. As soon as I can get my tablet to agree with me. Oh, I went to the wrong, that's what happened. Okay, sorry. I'll be right there in just a moment. I'll give you a chance maybe to get there with me. Hebrews chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 1 through 5, not word for word, but very quickly. And we read very importantly, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, in the prophets, and you can start naming all the prophets, You've got Elijah, you've got Samuel, you've got, you know, Haggai, you've got Zechariah, you've got Zephaniah. I mean, I could go on and on. There are many, many prophets. He's spoken in many portions, many scriptures, and in many diverse ways. In the last days, he's spoken to us in his son. That's the highest. That's, he spoke all these different ways, but it, the cherry on top, the crescendo, it was all building up to speaking to us in his son whom he appointed heir of all things. He, we know that all belongs to the Lord, that he redeemed it by his blood. So he's not only creator of it, he is the heir of it all. Uh, he is also one who made it. He was the creator. We saw that in Genesis 1 too. He is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. God spoke, it came into existence. We know the Father and the Son both were involved in creation. We know that, that, that they're, they're both expressed throughout our creation. We see the power of our God. And he is the one who made purification of sins. That's Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus specifically. He is the one that specifically sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So you see a love seat built for two. You see God the Father and God the Son sitting side by side. You see two there. You're not seeing the one at that point. Having become as much better than the angels. Notice the phrase, the Son that we've just described is better than the angels as he's inherited a more excellent name than they. When did he, uh, God ever say to the angels, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Begotten is that first ranked position, the highest position that can be. And again, I'll be a father to him, he shall be a son to me. When did God say that to any of the angels? He did not. He didn't even say it to Satan. We know Satan wanted to be worshipped by God and wanted to be in that highest position, but we do not see that God ever refers to any of the angels in that way. Never calls them his son, never tells them to sit on his throne in equal power at his right hand. That's given to Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, and to he only. And verse 6, I didn't even put that in, but verse 6, let all the angels of God worship him. So obviously, he is better than the angels. He is higher than the angels. Okay? Um, did I? Yeah, I did read about being begotten. I told you about that. Okay, now, prior to this time, though, prior to him sitting at the right hand on high, where God told him, sit and wait till all your enemies are your footstool. We know that time is coming. Prior to this time, we are told in Hebrews, I believe it's verse 13, if we just look down... Um, no, it's not. I forgot to write down the verse. 
we see it's somewhere in in Hebrews within the first or second chapter if it goes that far I'll probably find it in a minute but I'm scanning fast and I'm not finding it we see that he was made for a time a little lower than the angels okay in our humanity we are lower than the angels we do not have the ability that angels have we can't in a zip and we're there and doing something for God over there and then zip and we're over here we're not allowed to be in the presence in heaven and then go out on assignment and do and those thus forth and so on so when Yeshua put on that human form he humbled himself became human he confined himself to one body Yeshua did many miracles we know he was a greater then but we don't read about Yeshua being in Nazareth and at the very same moment being in Jerusalem and down in uh, Ashkelon or somewhere else do we we see he confined himself to one body and he's in one place at a time in that body the Spirit of God goes throughout the face of the earth Yehovah is not confined to a body but the Son chose to be confined that blows my mind that God in his infinity if I said that word right comes into one human being that God slipped into time slipped into space God put on a face that's what we call Yeshua Jesus question oh uh, well no I was going to say that it's on um, Hebrews 2 thank you 7 2 7 really mm -hmm. my mind seven. really wanted 13 because or 14 perfect thank you so much I appreciate that it's Hebrews 2 verse 7 you have made him a little while lower than the angels then you crown him with glory and honor okay so yes that's the verse I wanted and I'm looking I'm looking down in here also yeah I don't know why I so want it to be 13 or 14 it's I wanted to see if it was repeated and it's not so Hebrews 2 7 is the verse I wanted we see in Hebrews 1 3 or 4 that he's greater than the angels and then we see he's made a little lower than the angels and that's not um, disagreeing with scripture that's his timeline he was greater than the angels he became lower when he took on the human form and even though he will show himself in human form through all of eternity God has raised him up in the power and the position on high equal with God sitting on the throne he never lost that he just humbled himself and set aside some of his God abilities I'll put it that way you know when when he did so okay so seeing that let me show you also in verse in chapter one uh, and I think I already read it uh, well I did read it but what I want to point out is that the angels worship the Lord they know they're less than the Lord angels give worship unto God we see it in many different places you'll see it in Hebrews where we've just been reading but let me also take you real quickly to Tehillim to Psalm 148 verses 1 through 6 and I'll read that for you I have that already so I'm there quickly and it says hallelujah that's praise to God Praise Adonai, the Lord, from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his armies. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all shining stars. Praise him, highest heaven, waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of Adonai, for he commanded, and they were created. So who created? The angels, the armies, the sun, the moon, the stars, the heavens, the waters, who the one that that we're talking about Yah Adonai God the Lord God he's the one who commanded they were created he established them forever and ever he has given a law to which they must conform he's made a decree which will not pass away the angels don't get to be whatever they want to be when they decide oh I'd rather be no they are who they are for all of eternity Satan you are an angel for all of eternity you have turned yourself into a wicked angel but you didn't turn yourself into God you can't you never can and you never will hmm. now when we remember Yeshua always existed the angels were created you know who's on top 
So when we're saying the angel of the Lord, when we put that phrase together, we are not putting this in subjection. We are not saying that it's someone lower than the Lord. Colossians 1, 15 and 16, He, Yeshua Jesus, is the visible image of the invisible God. When did we get to see God? When he put on human form so we could see him. He's supreme over all creation because in connection with him were created all things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones, lordships, rulers, authorities, they've all been created through him and for him. Notice that, they're all for him. They're all at his beck and disposal. We know right now God could say, we know he won't because he promised, that he could say, human beings, zap, and we're gone. He could say to the angels, I'm tired of you. Fly away, be gone. <laughs> and they'd have to be gone. He's God. He is who he is. So if Yeshua is called the angel, how can he be called the angel of the Lord? How can he be lower than who he is himself? How can we bring these two together? And I'll take you back to t remind you what that word really means. When it says that there's that he is an angel in the Hebrew, that word Moloch means messenger. That this is a messenger. This is someone carrying out a message from God the Father. In Bereshit, Genesis chapter 48, Yaakov, Jacob, is blessing his son Joseph, Joseph, and he says, he refers to God as the angel who redeemed me from all evil. Now when Jacob's telling Joseph that about the angel that redeemed me from all the evil in my life, do you think for a moment he's talking about anybody less than God? No, you know he's not. Jacob's giving all credit to God. He's saying it all the way through scripture, or I shouldn't say he because it's not Jacob speaking, but we're going to see it. We're going to see that this God who redeemed Jacob from all evil, and if that's not a personification of Yeshua Jesus who shed his blood on the cross, we're going to see it from Genesis 48, actually Genesis 16 here, but even if you start at 48, you could go all the way through scripture. Go with me all the way to the other end. Go to Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1, and you have a strong angel that comes down from heaven, has the title deed of the, of the earth, puts one foot on the land, another foot on the sea, lifts up that title deed that's for the earth, and declares that he is the owner of this creation, of the creation of the earth, and he has a cloud with a rainbow about him. Now, a lot of people say in Revelation 10, it says angel. That can't be the Lord. It has to be an angel. But that description I just gave, can that be just an angel? He's got one foot on the land and the other on the sea. Okay, maybe if God gave an angel a huge ability, he could do that. But can an angel lift the title deed to the earth and declare, I am the owner of this creation? That belongs to God alone. God and Yeshua Jesus created this earth. Yeshua is the only one who bought it back with his blood. When we see clothed in a rainbow about him, and we know the rainbow speaks of the redemptive act of our God. Remember, redemption's arch in never-ending blessing of wonder. Wow, wonder of it all. Our God redeemed us. I think all the way through, when we see the angel of the Lord, we have the revelation of who God the Father is through the sun. I think it's made very clear. And that will bring us into what I was supposed to start with and forgot today. <laughs> I was supposed to answer the question of Hebrews 6 and verse 13 that we've got God swearing and swearing by someone else it seems. Look real quick and I'll answer this question at the same time and if I don't do it fully for the one who asked, remind me at the end of class and I will uh, pull out my other notes on this verse also. But Hebrews 6 and verse 13 says, For when God made the promise to Abraham, we're right there in the promise God's making to Abraham. He promised him the, a son, and through the son, the son would come. We know he promised him a large family, but you could take away all the other kids and all the other that come from, the begets and the begets and the begets, and it won't matter. What matters is connecting the dots. 
from Yitzhak, the miraculous born son, will come Yeshua, the seed, Galatians 3, who will redeem the, all mankind so through Abraham the world would be blessed. Okay, so when God made this promise to Abraham, he could swear by no one greater, so he swore by himself. He put up his right hand and he said, I swear, I'm telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. <laughs> okay, well, he didn't say, so help me God, because how could he say that part? But the whole point is, is he is confirming with the strongest words he can confirm that he keeps his word. I promised Abram, and I swear by myself, the one who has the ability to carry out that promise, and the only one who has the ability to carry out that promise, and the only one who no, nothing can take away the ability to carry out that promise. So the only one I can swear by is by myself. So I'm affirming it. I am like giving you a stamp of approval on top of stamp of approval. I'm giving you a closed case, and I'm still giving you 50,000 witnesses on top of it, in other words. I am affirming the affirmation. I am declaring it in the strongest words I can give. When I tell you I will never leave you nor forsake you, I'm giving it to you in five different words because the Greek will give you five different words for forsaken, abandoned, uh, forgotten, whatever. All those words, I'm giving it to you in every single way that I can. I'm showing you on every level that I can. Do I need to do that? No. My word right here at square one was sufficient. But because I know you human beings. Let me give it to you this way, and then let me give it to you that way, and then let me give it to you this way, and let me tell you that I have you in my hand. No one can take you out of my hand. You are so safe and secure, the most you can do is try to jump from knuckle to knuckle, and all you'll be is a knucklehead, because you still won't get out of my hand. But just to show you how safe that is, I'm gonna take my hand, that you're in my hand, and I'm going to put God's hand on top of my hand. And now you're double safe. You're under God's hand, and you're under Yeshua's hand. But God and Yeshua, you're one. You're right. <laughs> but look who I am. So God by himself swore and said, I'm giving you no room for doubt. No room for a little inkling of, mm, I hope. You know, that, that there isn't this one moment in, in, in time in one way. No. No, that would be like saying Satan is God's equal opposite. And he's not. And so God is swearing it by himself because there's nothing greater he can swear by. And he promises what he promises is that secure. I mean, this, this is, you can stake your entire life on it. I am. I'm staking my entire life, my salvation, on the fact that my God swore an oath and kept it by himself. Swore by himself, kept it by himself. He is it. Kit, kit, the whole kit and caboodle. The whole enchilada. Okay? Everything. That's what God is saying. And that's what we're seeing here. So this whole description, it doesn't just fit an angel. It doesn't just fit a created being of God. This description that we get from Bereshit to Revelation, this is a description of God. God is trying to show us and confirm to us in so many different angles and so many different ways that wherever you're looking at it, you can understand it. And you can grasp hold of this picture because once again, we are trying to put the ineffable God into effable language. And it's just not going to happen. We're never going to be able to fully bring it down to human level because it just isn't human. It's above. That's what we have. So God swore by himself because there was no one greater. He swears by himself in Jeremiah chapter 22. He's going to swear by himself with Hagar. Most people miss that, but God's going to say, I swear. In, with Hagar when we get back to Hagar. So in the mouth of three witnesses, we have it that God is saying, all I can do is swear by me because anything else would be less than me. So I'll swear it by me. I'll say it as Jehovah. I'll say it as Yeshua. I'll say it as Ruach HaKodesh. All three in one are declaring it. And we have no room to fear, to wonder, to question, to guess, to open any little hint of doubt. Seeing that, let's see if the angel of the Lord fits. 
Okay, because now I've declared 100% the angel of the Lord is the Lord he himself. I'm not giving it any room for the angel of the Lord to ever be a less than angel. Okay, no matter how great. Not even, I think, Michael and Gabriel are the two top angels. Not even their level. They even can't fit this. So when we look back in chapter 16, and we'll go through it verse by verse in a moment, but let me give you all the examples real quickly. When we look at the angel of the Lord with Hagar, the angel of the Lord is going to be omniscient. He's going to tell Hagar about her future descendants. He shows himself to be omnipotent. He makes promises that are going to happen. Omnipotent is his power. Omniscience is his knowledge. He knows it all, and he's promising something that's going to happen in the future. I want any one of you to go out on that edge, promise something's going to happen 50 years from now. Let me make it easy on you. Five years from now, I want you to promise me that, let, let's, let's say, let's say you're going to promise me, pick a name, that name's going to be the President of the United States in five years from now, and that president is going to be the, the most famous president. He's going to do something so great. All the other presidents will pale in comparison. And I want you to tell me what that one action is that he's going to do that's that great by that name. And let's add in the date. He's going to do it on July 13th, and we're in 2023, 2028. Okay, who wants to take my bet on? Who wants to tell me that? <laughs> and you're all laughing at me. You're all saying that's ridiculous, Rochelle. Well, this is what God does when he's the angel Lord with Hagar. He tells her her future. He tells something specifically. He says he's the God who sees and he, he understands. He shows compassion to her. We'll come back to some of that as we go through the verses in just a bit. But he's showing himself this is greater than just being an angel. In chapter 22, when he appears to Avram, this is when Avram, Avraham, because he's got his name changed by now, this is when he's ready to offer up Yitzhak, the, the sacrifice of Yitzhak. I'm trying to hurry. The angel Lord says there, you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now, any of the angels, could they say, oh, Abram, you haven't withheld Isaac from me. Isaac belongs to me. No. Isaac only belonged to God, to the one who created him. So the angel of the Lord, when he appears to Abraham, declares the angel of the Lord is me, God speaking. Okay? When he shows himself to Jacob, to Jacob, he says, and this is a second time, this is Genesis 31, he says this time to, to Jacob, I am the God of Bethuel. Okay, right there, that's not angelic talk, that's God talk. And then he says, well, you made a vow to me. Well, when did Jacob make a vow to an angel? Never. But he made a vow to God at Beth, Beth El, the house of God. He called it the house of God because God appeared to him there. Moshe, burning bush, Exodus chapter 3. Moshe doesn't say that's an angel. He identifies that as God. He, he sees this one demand worship. Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Worship me. When do the angels accept worship? Nowhere. When Yohanan falls on his face twice in the book of Revelation in awe and in wonder at what he is seeing, how, wow, and he falls on his face, the angel both times, get up, don't worship me, worship God and God only. Only God takes that worship. So with Moses, he accepts the worship. He is omniscient. He tells Moses, I've heard the cries in Egypt. I haven't heard the cries in Egypt. I haven't heard the cries in Israel come up to me. Rescue me. Save me. God, my Redeemer. No, but God, the angel of the Lord, heard those cries. He showed that, that he, had, he was immutable. There's nothing he could not do. I'm going to raise you up, Moses. I'm going to make you like the Redeemer. You're going to redeem these people out of bondage. And then he shows himself later in Scripture. Luke 4 says he came to set the captives free, drawing on the fact that Moshe was a type, but a less than, here's the greater. When he identifies himself at the time with Pharaoh, 
we have the angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind the camp. When did this happen? When the Red Sea gets parted. The Egyptian army can't see what's going on when the cloud finally lifts and they see the split in the Red Sea and they head in, they're going to go the same path that God made for the children of Israel. What happens? The waters come down, the Egyptian army drowns. Does he not show the angel of God that he has the power of God? What angel can part the Red Sea? What angel can drown the Egyptian army? What angel can blind and confound the Egyptian army while the, Red, the, while the children of Israel walk through the Red Sea unaffected? And if you're with me Saturday, you heard other miracles too. The wind, strong enough to part the sea in two directions, figure that one out, and it doesn't knock one Israeli off their feet. I walk out my door in 65 mile an hour winds and I gotta hold on so I don't go flying. Amazing, amazing. So the power attests to the angel of the Lord being the power of God and God alone. When he talks with Balaam, the unfaithful prophet who could do nothing but bless Israel, didn't want to, but that's all he could do, the angel of the Lord talks through the donkey. The, well, actually, the, the donkey talks, but the angel of the Lord is standing there with the sword. Remember? The donkey saw. The donkey knew. The donkey stopped. It was the angel of the Lord there. And yet, in the story, when you read it, it's going to say that God was angry and that the angel of the Lord took his stand. So, in that one story alone, you have the angel of the Lord equated with God the Father in that one story alone. When God speaks to Israel as the angel of the Lord, he identifies himself and says, I, the angel of the Lord, brought you up out of Egypt. Now, did Gabriel, did Michael, did another unnamed angel bring him up out of Egypt? No. That was the miraculous hand of God and God alone. And he identifies himself as the keeper of Israel's covenant. He requires obeisance, Again, that only belongs to God. And he says, if you don't bow down to me, you don't worship me, you don't obey me, you will go into captivity as punishment. And we see it happen. When God spoke with Samson, Judges chapter 13, the sovereignty of God is seen there. Actually, the story is with Samson's parents. It's Manoah. Manoah is Samson's father. I think I asked you that question last week and I just gave the answer. <laughs> Sorry, forgot to see if you did your homework. But when Manoah is, is seeing God, he identifies it. He, he actually will call this one wonderful. The same word in Hebrew that Isaiah 9, 6 declares belongs to the Son of God. Manoah is seeing the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord goes up in the fire in front of Manoah and his wife. You want a mind blower? Go read Judges 13. It's an amazing manifestation of the power that belongs to God and God alone. And yet Manoah declares that the one, that one is wonderful. Isaiah says the one that's called wonderful is the son that's given. The child that was born. Yes. What did you say? Noah is the father of Samuel. Manoah. Manoah, M-A-N-O-A-H, Manoah, is the father of Samson. And you read about him in Judges 13, mind-blowing chapter. David's disobedience, the angel of the Lord, executes judgment over Jerusalem in, 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 because of David's disobedience. First Chronicles 21, we see Yeshua executing judgment over Jerusalem in Revelation 19, when he comes back in the battle of Armageddon, to stop the battle. The same one that we saw in First Chronicles is the same one we see in Revelation 19. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 1 verse 12, chapter 3 verse 14, here we see the angel Lord, we see the, the mediator for Israel, we see this one as the one opposing Satan, and this one says that he is the purifier of righteousness. Who can purify us? Who can make us righteous? There's no angel that can do that. I do not pray to an angel for my purification and my righteousness. I pleaded for that in the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus who clothed me in his robe. So when you see that this one, this angel of the Lord, purifies in righteousness, it's got to be the Lord himself. 
So in summary, I say the angel Lord is God. The angel Lord is distinct from God. He is the one we call Yeshua who carries out the work of, the, of God, who was the messenger sent from God, who was to reveal God to the people. You know, how do we understand God if you take out the Son of God? We have nothing to help us understand. It's like the man that was ready to stomp on an ant hill, saw the little ant scattering, pulled his foot back and, and said, you're okay, little ants, I don't want you to worry, I'm not going to, to clobber you. Did the ant say, oh, okay, we're fine now then? <laughs> no, all they knew is what they saw coming at them. And this man thought, how can I communicate to these ants that they don't need to fear? And he thought, oh, if only I could become an ant, I could tell them. And he realized that's what God did. I want you to know no fear. I want you to know that I'm not going to clobber you. I want you to know I've prepared a way of redemption for you. But how can I communicate that to you? Oh, I know. I'll become one like you. And I'll communicate through that one. Now, I said like you because he isn't. He was fully human, but he was fully divine at the same time. So in conclusion, the angel of the Lord has to be the Lord himself, has to be a messenger sent by God to use that word angel, but it has to be the Son of God in personification. And then that fits fully with why you never see the title used once he came down in human form and lived his life here on this earth because the angel Lord did not need to appear in that way. Now he is incarnate. He has appeared in his incarnate form. He's put on a face that we will see one day. Do you realize that? You will see the face of God. We'll call him Yeshua. We will see the Father also. Because we know we see the two sitting on the throne. We see the Father in, in some way exemplify hair and eyes and hands. We, we hear that. But he's also at the same time not going to be a human form. Because Jehovah, God the Father, never took on human form. It was God the Son who took on human form. But we're going to see the very one that the Talmudim saw. We're going to see the very one that... Miriam saw grow up in front of her eyes. That blows my mind. Can you imagine? And I'm taken back to that moment in time this year, that, that, that the end of last year, that little treat that I had, seeing a play that brought in the nativity, and they used a real baby, who in the midst of a very precious song in the play between Mary and Joseph and the baby, the baby reached out and started touching the face of Mary and the face of Joseph. And it just brought it such to life that Mary was looking at the face of God. Ooh, wow. Who could have thunk such a plan to be who he is and relate it to his creation? Oh my God. And I don't give that to you in a curse word. I give that to you in, oh, my God. Which just happens to be the last three words. Someone very dear to my heart who loved the Lord with all his heart, who was an on fire for the Lord, servant of the Lord, who had come close to death many a time physically in his aging and in his little mobile home, his wife came around the corner just in time to hear those words as she saw her husband looking up. Oh, my God. And he was gone. Hallelujah. I didn't get to see his face. Fanny Crosby, blind from birth. Someone saying to her, don't you, aren't you sorry? You'll never get to see God's creation. You'll never get to see a puppy dog. You'll never get to see the face of your mama. You'll never get to see these, these things that we do find dear and they should be dear to us. And Fanny, in her heart that was so devoted to her God, says, Oh, honey, 
I'm not feeling bad. I don't regret the very first thing I'll ever see is the face of my God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a God who presents himself, takes the ocean and puts it in the teacup, takes the <laughs> ineffable and makes it effable, takes his face and calls himself the angel of the Lord. Wow. <laughs> sorry, I get excited. I'm not oh, well, sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm not I sorry. I love this. <laughs> Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord. And now think about who that means to you. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And he rescues them. Who's the them? <laughs> Who's the them? We's the them. We's the them. <laughs> Patty said it and I love it. The English and all. We's the them. We's the them. You are encamped by the angel of the Lord. And you're rescued. <clears throat> Your Red Sea will part. Your Egyptian army will drown. And God will never, ever, no, in no way, uh-uh, fail you abandon you, forget you, carved you on the palm of his hand. And I love to say, you know how he carved it? You know how it's etched? By a nail. That's how he etched your name into his hand. That's the angel of our Lord. Michelle? <sighs> yes? It is amazing that the Lord, even before he took human form, Yes. And he, you know, there's nothing that we go through on this earth that he hasn't already done. He suffered, he's had hunger, weary, he, tired. He had he humility. He humbled himself even before the angels, before he even took human form. He humbled himself. And yeah, that amazes from, me to be who he is. And I see the Shamash candle, the white candle lifted up on the menorah. Yeah bowing down to light in the hearts of the others. What a God, and, and again, the magnanimous mind of God that found a way to communicate. He made us, and then he found a way to communicate. He found a way to be Emmanuel, God with us. This is who we're studying. This is the angel of the Lord. This is Emmanuel, God with us. This is the one who said, let us make man in our image. He's separate from God, distinct from God, the Father, distinct from the Spirit, and yet he is God, the Father, and the Spirit. Yes, Rowena? I was just wondering, when the angel of the Lord appeared to them, do they recognize this as God? <laughs> Hagar will answer that for you in just a few <laughs> moments. <laughs> okay. And, and absolutely, the answer is yes, but we'll see it with Hagar in just a few minutes. Um, let me see if there's anything else I want to say. I think I have said it clearly. Um, I've got so many verses that, that go from this into the deity when our Jewish people want to say, well, okay, Messiah is, is the Lord. Uh, you know, he's the Redeemer, but he's not God. No, this gives no room for that. If he is God, he is the Son. If he is the Son, he is God. You cannot separate the two. And I think just the last thing to say, we've, we've kind of touched on it with the humility that, that Patty was just saying also in Luke 4. Um, start with verse 16. Read 16 to 21 on your own. I've taught on this recently too, so it might be repeat for you, and that's another reason why I'll shorten it right now. But verse 18 says, The Spirit of Adonai, the Spirit of the Lord, is upon me. Now who is speaking? Yeshua is speaking here. And he's saying, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He is the Spirit of the Lord. He is the Lord. How can he say that? Because he's separating, showing God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He's, he's saying it in the same way that he can say, and we now see and understand, the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate theophany of our God. He is Christ. He's not an angel. He is the angel of the Lord who is the Lord he himself. The Spirit of Adonai is on him, anointed him. Good news for the poor. Proclaim freedom for the prison. Renew sight for the blind. Receive, release, release those who have been crushed or have been made captive to proclaim 
the year of favor of Adonai, the year of the Lord. This is when the Lord said, this will be. I get a kick out of the fact that for a long time there, the people who did the calendar had it right. They called it A.D., Adonai, Ad, Adonai, in the year of our Lord. They got that part right. It's the Lord. It's his year. It's his calendar. It's not our, oh, look how smart we got. We got a calendar. <laughs> it's perfectly ordained so that Messiah, Yeshua, the angel of the Lord in the incarnation came at the perfect time. He didn't come too early where he would grow up and be at that age to be the, the redeemer through his crucifixion. If he'd done that in Samuel's day, they didn't have crucifixion. If he had done it today, we don't crucify. But he did it in a perfect time when he'd be that age to die on the cross, exactly like Psalm 22 described 700 years before they know that word crucifixion and carry it out. God is awesome. God is amazing. And when Yeshua finished reading Isaiah, because Isaiah said what he just said, then he closed the scroll and he said, today it's been fulfilled in your ears. Wow. So take all that back now. Come back with me into Genesis 16. Believe it or not, we're going to move forward in Genesis. But I think this, you're going to see the angel Lord several more times in bare sheet in Genesis. So I felt it's critical. And especially because here is our beginning marker. If you miss who the angel of the Lord is in chapter 16, you're going to miss it in 31. You're going to miss it in Exodus 3. You're going to miss it all the way through. And again, you're going to go all the way through to Revelation missing who the angel the Lord is. I couldn't do that. I felt like we've got to take a good look and see. Thank and you're welcome. And thank you, because I love to share it. But I want you to be able to argue against those who say, oh, no, 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 no. This is just an angel. <laughs> oh, so an angel is omnipotent, omnipresent. An angel is able to prof prophesy what's coming. An angel is able to make it happen. An angel is able to carry it out. An angel is able to to show up, okay, I said enough. I could go through the whole lesson again. The angel Lord, only the Lord has the abilities and the power that we see equal to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the three in one. And I rest my case. <laughs> so, how did the angel speak to, and here we go, how did he speak to Hagar? And let's see, to answer Rowena's poignant question, and a very good question, to see how did Hagar respond? Did she recognize who this was? This is our introduction to the angel of the Lord. What did Hagar know in her life? Did she, was she able to know who this is? And did she see him as who we're saying? And I'll tell you, she gives the answer very clearly. So let's, let's read it, let's find out. The angel of the Lord found Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. Okay, on the way to Shur, and um, let's see, I know it's on, on the way to Egypt, but I've got something, there we go. It's in the Negev Desert, on the way back to Egypt, it's near Mount Sinai. So she's headed down, and because she came from Egypt, this is why I think she was on the run back home. Where else is she going to go? If you've been taken away as a slave and you're escaping your slavedom <laughs> where you're supposed to be, where are you going to go? You're going to head back to your family. You're going to head back to where you know familiarity, where you can get the help you need. So I believe really fully she was on her way back home to her home. She's in the wilderness, though. The spring, the fountain of water, it was like a well because we see in verse 14, therefore the well was called. So the spring of water really is a well, I believe. Um, you know, it, it springs up and they made a well there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But in the wilderness, okay? Now the well speaks to us of the water of life that Yeshua offers. He tells us that it'll be like a well that's springing up and never runs dry. In the wilderness, not in the luxuries. She wasn't in Abram's world now. She is out on her own. She's in the wilderness and Yeshua finds her He's her restorer, and he's the refresher of her soul. 
I say that because when we see water go through scripture, and we're going to see the children of Israel are given water from the rock. And 1 Corinthians, I think it's 10, tells us that the rock is Yeshua, Jesus. It, it doesn't leave it open for question, but as you follow that rock, the same way we just follow the angel of the Lord, you follow the rock through scripture, you know it's Yeshua who bring out bring out, brought out uh, water miraculously, enough to water two and a half million people and the livestock they had with them and the water they needed to cook with and the water they needed to bathe with. I mean, that's a lot of water. Another miracle that's going on. And when we get all the way to Yochanan, to John chapter 4, we have the woman at the well. And we have the Lord tell her, give me a drink of water. And I'm a Samaritan. I'm half Jewish, but I'm the ones that are, are we're the Hatfields and the McCoys, you know, where, where we battle with each other. You're talking to me, and you're asking of me. And Yeshua's answer to her is, if you'd known who you were talking to, you would have asked for the water that you'll never thirst again. And he goes on and he uses and brings out what we see as a personification of the water of life. The water of the Word of God washes us, it cleanses us, and it satiates us, and it feeds us eternally. The living water of the Word of God will sustain you, and it will refresh you. So when you see all that, here she is found by a well. She's needing to be refreshed. She's needing to be renewed. In her physical condition, she's human. She needs water in that wilderness, and so she stopped at this well to get that on her way back to her her people, and the Lord steps into her life, steps into her circumstances. Notice verse 8. He, the angel of the Lord, said, Hagar. Now, notice he didn't say, <coughs> who are you? <laughs> he calls her by name. He knows it all. There's your omnipresent angel of the Lord. Hagar. And then he tells her who she is. And notice very clearly the description according to God, according to the angel of the Lord. Sarah's, or Sarai, I'm sorry, Sarai's slave woman. Notice what he didn't say. Hagar, Abraham's, quote, wife, or Abraham's concubine, or Abraham's whatever you want to call her. He called her what she was as God sees it. She was not Abraham's wife. Sarai was Abraham's wife. She intercepted or you know, came into a position of something that belonged to the wife, but she was not the wife. She was not the replacement. And he reminds her, that's who you are. You are Hagar. You are a slave woman. From where have you come and where are you going? Now, if this angel Lord is so knowledgeable is he asking her because he doesn't know where she's going and where she came from? <laughs> no. He's getting her to talk back to him. we got a problem here. We need to have some communication. So when he asks her that, he's reminded her of her position. He's told her, you're not married to Abraham. I know who you are. You are nothing but a slave. Where are you going? Where did you come from? And Agar answers. She says, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Very true. She's running from Sarai, who's made her life miserable. I think she made Sarai's miserable, and Sarai's just getting back, but two wrongs do not make a right. So she tells it. She says exactly the truth. That's who she is, what she's doing. She's running from the one she belongs to. And notice how God deals with her, the angel of the Lord. Sorry, the one in the same bed. Verse 9, so the angel Lord said to her, return to your mistress, Sarai. Oh, no, that's not there. Return to your mistress. My eyes jumped. Okay. Return to your mistress and submit to her authority. <laughs> Who? That wasn't what she wanted to hear, I'm sure. I got to go back? That was not the message she would hope to hear. She probably wanted to hear, oh, you poor thing. You've been so mistreated. Yes, you know, let, let's just miraculously get you on the other side down in Egypt and you can go on and have a happy life. But God doesn't say that to her. He tells her, humble herself. Now the fact that he tells her to humble herself shows that God saw her in rebellion. He saw her not 
under Sarai's authority. She was buckling against it. So she, in essence, had a hand in making her circumstances miserable. Had she been um, humble, had she been dutiful to Sarai, there probably wouldn't have been the friction. That's why I think she really was giving Sarai a hard time. She might have felt justified, but regardless, he told her what her position is. Sarai is an authority over you. You are under her hands. This is where you belong. You are to go back and submit to her. Let her be your master or mistress and you be her servant. Now what I want you to see in this is not that God didn't have a heart for Hagar because he's going to keep talking with her. I want you to see that by his grace he sought her out. He looked for her because he had grace toward her. Now grace does not overlook sin. It doesn't overlook and say it's okay you did something wrong. No. God's righteousness, he had to call out what was wrong. She was rebellious. She wasn't in the position she was supposed to be in. And so God's righteousness counseled her. His righteousness said, there's something wrong here. Grace doesn't release us from our responsibilities. We can't say, oh, I'm under grace, so I can do that sin. I don't have to, to conform here. I can do that because I'm forgiven under grace. No, grace brings you the presence of God to you, but he's still going to deal rightly and justly with you. And there are consequences to our actions. Grace by righteousness upholds our responsibility toward God toward our neighbors, toward whoever God has put into our lives. And Hagar is going to have to patiently endure being a slave for a number of years still. It's going to be 14, maybe 15 years before God releases her from the household of Avraham. But he's going to be with her. He sought her out. By grace, he meets her where she's at. He lovingly corrected her. He didn't come down and condemn her, and he didn't send her off into consequences. Because of it, he sent her back, told her what she needs to do, and brought her back into that right place. When she finally leaves, it's uh, chapter 21. It'll be a while before we get there, but if you want to see where she leaves, read Genesis 21, 12 to 14. In that, knowing she has to go back, God doesn't leave her hopeless. God doesn't leave her miserable. God gives her a wonderful promise. We read it in verse 10. Verse 9 told her, go back, submit. Verse 10, the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. Hagar, you're going to be blessed with a lot of children, grandchildren. They're going to be your descendants so many that they're going to be too many to count. He had a purpose for her. He had a purpose in her life. She wasn't just a thing to be used. She was a human being. And he's meeting her on that level. Shall I have a dumb question. <clears throat> Since she was a slave mm -hmm. and had no say in what happened to her, mm -hmm. you know, it was Correct. not her decision Correct. to have relations with mm -hmm. Abram, mm -hmm. is that looked upon her as sin? The sin was not being um, conformed to Sarai's authority, rebelling against Sarai and running away from Sarai. Right, that was sin. That was sin. Yes, not the action. Not the action. No. Okay. No. And the child, the result of that action is not looked at as, oh, that child's just sin. No. No. God doesn't blame, you know. And in fact, God's saying, I've got purpose for this child. There's going to be more that come from this child. She's going to have so many that God's got purpose. Sounds very similar to the promise God's given Abraham. I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you so many descendants you can't count, which is more than he gives Hagar, but he, he, he uses it in a bigger you know, picture. But again, we don't see, no, the, she's not blamed for the act, and she's not blamed for being pregnant, and the son does not come out under a, a cloud of of you're condemned, you know, you're, you're judged for it. So no, no, it's, that's a good point, not at all. She just needed to stay in line. She needed to continue to be Sarai's slave, and she needed to act respectfully to Sarai. 
and if she did, and God's working on her, you know God's going to work on Sarai to treat her right and to do right by her and to bring this about. But what we're going to see is the human stays in there, the human equation on both sides. The friction stays there, and the friction's passed down to the children because we're going to see that Hagar's son Ishmael taunts little Yitzhak to the point that makes Sarai say, get rid of him, get him out of this house, I don't want him around my kid. And there's not a good mama that wouldn't defend her child who is being picked on by a bully because he's actually bullying. But again, is there actions? Is there human actions? But at this point, he's just telling her, hey, I've got a great plan for you. This, this, you've, got, you know, you've got value here. That's why I sought you out because you have value by grace. You are loved. Come back into your circumstances and we're going to go on down this path together because he tells her a little bit more. He tells her what we already know, and she knew too. Behold, you are pregnant. You will give birth to a son. She didn't need a revealing party. She didn't need a sonogram. She didn't wait nine months to find out what she's having. <laughs> she gets told up front and early, you're going to have a son. And furthermore, he says, you shall name him Ishmael. This is the first time that God, his name, well, he named it on. I gotta take that back. But the you know the first time that we're told where God is giving the name ahead of time. Okay, so the, does the name Ishmael mean anything? Yes, it does. I'm glad you asked. You're right on point. If you didn't hear a question, Doris said, okay. So does the name Ishmael mean anything? It absolutely does. Um, by the way, let me let me say because of what Patty just said too. Obedience would mean blessing. Refusal to obey could have even meant death because she's out in the wilderness. She's going to get away from that spring, trying to get back to Egypt on her own. If she continued to stay rebellious against God and what God had ordained for her to do, she could have ended up dead. Okay? But God wanted to bring her back under where his protection is going to be there for her and he is going to fulfill promises. And that's the principle in our life too. You keep going out. He warns you, and you keep going away from him, you can bring consequences and even death to yourself. But under his wing, you will find protection and safety, and you will find blessing in the midst of your circumstances. So go back, Hagar. You are pregnant. You're going to give birth to the son, and I'll put it this way. The first time God names the child in advance he named Adam after he created him. So the first time he names in advance is here. And he says, call your son Ishmael. Because Ishmael means God hears. God heard her. God heard her cries. God knew her hurt. God saying, I hear you. Do you know how much value we feel as a human being when we think someone's hearing us? Someone that needs to hear us? Sometimes that's all we need is, I need to be heard. How many of you said that sometime in your life? I need to be heard. God is meeting her there. He's reminding her that in his mercy and in his grace, I know right where you're at. I heard your cries. I know your need. I'm going to take care of you, Hagar. Don't run out from under my protection. No, come back, stay in my protection, and I hear you. I'm going to take care of you. And he tells Avram and Sarai also because every time that little child is being called by name, they're going to be hearing, God hears, God hears, you know, God hears, come for dinner, God hears, you can go out and play, God hears, it's time for bed. They're going to be hearing constantly and being reminded, God hears, God hears, God hears. Remember, Avram and Sarai feel like this is a time of silence. God, you promised so long ago. And you know what, God? My body is now dead. I'm not having the cycle of life that I can produce life. And what's more, my, my, <laughs> my old man is dead too. <laughs> His body isn't able to produce. They're getting panicky. God, are you hearing? Have you ever, in the midst of your circumstances, said, God, are you hearing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ishmael, God hears. God hears, is that what it means? Hears. Yeah, God hears. God hears. He hears, he shall hear, he does hear. And what he said is true. Ishmael is the progenitor of the Arabs. 
Mohammed claimed to be from Ishmael, whether he was or not. <laughs> but Ishmael, as the ancestor of the Arab people, is the first one that God named before he was born, shows God had a plan for Ishmael. This son, this product of that sin, God had a plan for. And that's what I was trying to say earlier. Ishmael is not a nothing. He's not worthless. He's not to be cast aside. He's not to be stomped on. He wasn't considered condemned before he was even born. God says, no, that's a precious life. I've got a purpose for that life also. Uh, God could have allowed Hagar to go off. He could have let this disappear. Avram and Sarai could have not had a constant reminder of their their failure to trust God in the midst of their um, circumstances. But no, God chose. He chose to bring them back in. He's telling the guard, don't rebel. I'm using you in the midst of this home. You're a living testimony. God hears. And you, uh, there's nothing more other than that. God has heard. Now, you need to take action. I've heard you. God may be saying to you, I've heard you. I've heard your cries. Now it's time for you to take the right action. Don't run away. Don't stay rebellious. Don't get impatient. Whatever the need is, he may be telling you that. And you need to say, okay, Ishmael, God hears. Now, what action should I take? And if God tells you you need to get back in line, get back in line. If God tells you you're not out of line, but don't be impatient, don't take it into your own hands, wait for my timing, then you better settle down, <laughs> humble yourself, submit, and wait. Those are not easy words. We don't like those words. We'll be honest. But God has that perfect timing. And if you wait, I can guarantee you, you're going to see when you see it happen, you're going to be able to say, wow, that was the exact perfect timing, because that's my God. But he tells Hagar about her son also. He says, the Lord has heard your affliction. He's heard your pain. He's heard your suffering. He's heard your cry. The same way he's going to hear the Israelites in Egypt cry out, and he brings them a redeemer. So he's going to take care of Hagar. He's telling her that. But he does tell her what her son will be like. And this isn't the nicest, but this is God telling fact. And it plays out to be exact because God is exact. He's always right. He says, this son, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live in defiance of all his brothers. Okay, a wild donkey, a wild ass of a man, what that means is he'd be unbridled, he'd be unrestrained, he'd be untamable by nature, he'd be rough, he would be raw, and we see that in the traits of the Arab world to this day, and I'm not demeaning a people, I'm telling what a culture people are like. We know that, that they are um, less, what's the word I want? The way the Arab will treat their children, they'll use their children to be their human shields. They don't value the life of the children. That's the nature that is found in the Arab world. The nature in the Israeli world, and not saying that they're always right and they're always good, but in this one area, they, every life is precious, including those Arab lives. They will not use their children for human shields. And what's more, they will treat their enemies' children in their hospitals. And I can attest to that by fact. I have seen the Arabs receiving free treatment for themselves, for their children, for the victims of the wars in the hospitals in Israel. It's a different mindset. They see value in that life, and they hope they're going to reach their enemy by taking care of their enemy's child. So it's, it's just a different mindset. Um, and it's just God called it. It's just what it is. When it said that he was going to be, um, uh, where to go? Uh, okay, it doesn't say it exactly, but when he'll live in defiance of all his brothers, um, he, Ishmael's going to go out. He's going to live in the Arabian Desert. He's going to live in the area of Gilead, east of the Jordan River, between Galilee and the Dead Sea. We'll read in, in Bear Sheet 37, his progeny carrying on. 
It's the beginning of those that are called Ishmaelites in Scripture in chapter 37 in Genesis. And again, all the way down to in, in 6 to 700 AD, you had Muhammad say, Ishmael's my ancestor whether it was true or right, whether he could prove it or right. I mean, he was part of the Arab race. Whether he could claim all the way back in that line to Ishmael, I don't know. But anyway, um, it being against him, or in defiance of all his brothers, again, they are a belligerent, a hostile people. They take sword against their, you know, Arab will fight Arab with swords. Um, there's an incessant state of feuding. I often say, I thank God for the Arab fighting the Arab because if the enemies of Israel ever all got together and got on the same page, they could wipe out Israel because they would so outnumber Israel. But in other words, while Hamas is fighting Fatah, it weakens them to fight Israel. And that's what we're seeing in the scripture. God said, you're going to be at defiance with your brothers. You're going to be, um, you know, warring against them. So everything he said just happened to be exactly what we see still playing out to this day. Um, I'm looking for where it says, you give birth, you'll name him Ishmael, he'll be a wild donkey, and, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live in defiance. Okay, somewhere in there, I have in verse 12, and it must come out of the Hebrew. Um, anyway, what, what the point is, if oh, in the presence of, or in the face of, you may have in the old King James, it has to the east of. And that meant, that was a, uh, because the Lord would come from the east, that meant in the presence of or before the face of. So if your scripture is saying to the east of, that's what it's meaning, that um, before the presence of the Lord, um, he would be. In other words, God knows where he's at too, okay? That he's not forgotten, not cared for, you know. God knows where he's at, but he's going to live out there in the wilderness like a wild man against even his own brothers he's going to live a wild untamed life it, it's just these are the facts yes so um how do you say the name of the whale because then said therefore the whale was called yes you're ahead of me oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay she's reading verse 14 so uh and i will pronounce it for you in the hebrew there let me tell you esau marries Ishmael's daughter, okay, when he takes one of his wives, okay, you've got Isaac and Ishmael are brothers, okay, Isaac has Jacob, Jacob and Esau are brothers, Esau is going to marry one of the Ishmaelites, he's going to marry one of the descendants from Ishmael, Ishmael's actual daughter, when we get the names in scripture, and the people that come from that line are called the Edomites in Scripture. That's Genesis 28 and verse 9. So just showing you how the Arab nations developed. They came from Hagar. And they're the Edomites, the Ishmaelites, some of these names that, that we're going to recognize. Now, to answer Dora, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. Sorry, let me rephrase that, say it the right way. Okay, God's just spoken to her, told her what's going to be, who she's pregnant with what he's going to be like. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God who sees me. For she said, have I ever seen him here and lived after he saw me? So you are a God who sees me. The Hebrew says, you are a God of seeing, indicating that she was saying, oh, you do see me. You are going to take care of me. She was recognizing this God actually saw her and heard her cries and cared about her. So she saw his grace, she felt his love. Then she says, and I'll, I'll give you the name in the Hebrew in a moment. Then she says, um, okay, you're the God who sees me. For she said, have I ever seen him here? And lived after he saw me. She could have said it this way, have I even remained alive after seeing him? Because remember how I started out when we talked about the angel of the Lord and the scripture in Yochanan said no one has ever seen the Father and lived. And remember when Moshe says, God, I want to see you. And God says, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll let you see what's left behind after I leave my glory that remains behind because anything more than that would blind you, would kill you. So she's saying, have I really seen God and I've lived? You know, she's realizing the, the wow factor, and he did 
camouflage himself in a sense in the angel of the Lord. She didn't see fully in a way that is ignoring what scripture says. But what she, oh, and by the way, um, Exodus 20 and verse 19, Exodus 33 and verse 20, 33 is where um, Moshe is asking to see the glory of God, asking to see God. Those two verses also say the same thing as John, that you can't see God and live. You just can't in your human form. That's why we're changed before we hit heaven, because we can't in our human form see him and, and live. You can't look at the sun and not have your eyes damaged. Can you imagine looking at the Son of God or God himself in all his glory? Boom, there goes your eyeballs, okay? So she's realizing that, wow. This is, this is God, and, and he's revealed himself to me. He's seen me. He's heard me, and I'm living. I'm surviving, and what that did or should have done is strengthened her in her faith. It does show she had a faith in God. She had to have learned that in the house of Avram. She didn't learn that in Egypt. Egypt did not have God-fearers didn't have those who worshiped the one true and living God. But her time in Avram's house, even as a slave, was a blessing to her because she could have stayed in Egypt free and never come to know the one true and living God. But she obviously came to know who he was. When Avram had these moments, when God showed him in the Gospel of the Stars the salvation of Yeshua, Jesus, do you think he kept that to himself? No, no, there's no way he would have kept it to himself. What happens when you have something, those of you who are married, when you have something really exciting, mind-blowing experience happen to you in the day, are you going to not tell your wife or your husband at night? No, as soon as you see him, guess what happened today, honey? <laughs> and you're going to tell. Well, Avram, they're living in the tents there. He's going to gather his whole family around and say, look, listen to what God showed me today. My mind is blown. Let me tell you what's coming. And as he shared his faith in God, they too came to faith. They came to believe. Hagar didn't say, who are you? Hagar didn't argue with, why can you tell me this about my future? We don't say Hagar ask any questions that deny who God is. She recognized the God that Avram had introduced her to. And this God wasn't just the God of Avram, this was the God of Hagar. And she is realizing, wow, he sees me, he hears me, he's going to take care of me. It should have strengthened her faith. Now I can go back in, I can live under Sarai, and I know it's going to be okay because my God is with me. That's where she should have come out. It doesn't stay that way, we see, but that's where it should have come out. It should have changed her and enabled her to live in the circumstances that God had allowed for her best good. Did she like being a slave? Probably not. But was it worth it? Would you rather be a slave your entire life and meet the God of Israel and have salvation in heaven forever? Or would you rather have freedom here on earth and end up in an entirety of a, an eternity of hell? Did she go back and tell people? I would imagine. Or did she keep that to herself? What does it say? It doesn't, it doesn't say. say. We're not told. But yeah. I could see, if she really caught the lesson at this moment, I could see her returning and saying to Sarai, you know what, I'm sorry. I should not have run. I shouldn't have been treating you like I did. My God heard me. My God spoke to me. My God's corrected me. And I'm here to humble myself before you. I'm here to be your servant. I'm here to fulfill the role that I am to do here and now in this life. That's what she should have said. Whether she had that conversation or not, I don't know. And like I say, we know it all goes south. You know, when we see the children, we don't see that attitude. And we finally have Hagar and the son go out. They are out of Avram's house. But that, that comes down the line. So what she did in the immediate, I don't know. But how else could she come back and eat humble pie <laughs> without saying, hey, there's a change in me. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm corrected. I'm, I'm guessing. Rhonda? Yeah, I'll go to you next, Dosi. Go ahead, Rhonda. We know that Israel worships the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But at this given moment, they're saying that 
God of Abraham is the God that Hagar loves and worships in this moment. In this moment, yes. But she... as time progresses, they don't worship who Isaac and Jacob worship. No. It's no. like it's the same God, but then as time goes on, they don't fall in line with what right. the God of Peter and Isaac and Jacob require. Right. Remember, right. we follow the line, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, we go down to Messiah. We follow the line, Ishmael, and we've just been told we're going to go to the Ishmaelites, the Edomites. We're going to go to those who are outside of the God worshipers. The same way that God said, you know, all the way back with Seth, he's the godly line, the sons of God. Remember chapter 6, these are the ones that did follow. The daughters of men were the ones that did not follow the godly line. So yes, Hagar for herself personally must have come to believe, I think even before this, must have been believing in the God of Avram because she doesn't deny, she doesn't say, well, why should I listen to you? And why should I care? You're his God. She doesn't pull anything like that. And she is obedient to what he says. She does go back. But unfortunately, it does not carry on. You know, she does not correct her son. It seems that it, she's with her son, the two of the same mind, when they're going to go out because they've caused such strife in the home because they're taunting and coming at the one who is the son of promise. Could be out of jealousy. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the reason is wrong actions, and they'll pay the consequences for those wrong actions. And because God prophesied it and said it, your son's going to be wild. He's not going to be tamed. Well, if we're not under God's hand, we're wild. We're not tame. So it shows Ishmael, I don't believe, did come under God as God, you are my ruler, you are my head, and I will obey you. We don't see that attitude in him. So no, it doesn't carry on. But at this point, I think Hagar had to have had a heart soft toward God so that God could work in her and correct her and bring her back. I think I was supposed to go to okay, Dora so and then Dosi. Yeah. Am I getting too far ahead? So it's going to be two brothers against each other? That's what we're going to see. Yeah. When you see one Ishmael. And one not godly. Right. Right. Ishmael and Isaac. In essence, that's what you're going to see. The godly and the ungodly again as we go down the line. Yes. And I've still got to give you the name in Hebrew, but we're coming to it. We're almost there. Um, Dosi. There you are. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, the different. Uh, this I know this was before Jesus' time. Yes. But um, the angels that uh, people see, I'm sure I'm not the only person who has encountered an angel before. So what's the difference? Was that God messenger that I encountered back in 2000 when the angels appeared to me? That's, and that's, I spoke to them. Yeah, that's an angel of the Lord, not the angel of the Lord. Remember, the angel of the Lord, we don't see an appearance after uh, Yeshua, Jesus, is born in human flesh. The okay. angel of the Lord, very God himself, no, you have not seen him. But yes, God has used angels in a multitude of people's lives. Some have seen in different forms and all. We know, you know, the angels are able to take on different forms, but those are his messengers that are sent out that the Hebrew says they're ministering to the saints who are about to receive salvation you know those those who are say we we do have our salvation but it's yes. it's in our possession when we're in heaven you know it's promised to us now promised and sealed by the spirit of God but no that that would be lesser angels that would be those that God has created it's not God okay. himself um, okay. Rowena could it be that's why they are uh, a troubled culture right now because the very first thing that God said to Hagar was to submit yourself to her authority and that did not happen. Right. And, and only and, for a short while while she was pregnant, but after that... Right. And do we not see that today? It, Israel is to be the head nation. The brothers have always been jealous of that. They should not be jealous of it. Is an order that God has intended because he said through Israel all will be blessed but instead there's the jealousy and there's the 
the friction. And, and yes, it, it only lasts a short time in Hagar. We don't even know how long in her. But at least at this time, she does submit and go back. So I've got to say she did hear. She did take the right action initially. It just doesn't last, you know, as we see, as we go down the line. Um, before I answer any more questions, if they're there, just because we're running right there to the edge and some already are leaving, let me finish verse 14 so we have our complete thought here and answer um, Dora's question. Um, so in, in 13, God's seen her and she's amazed that she was even able to live, but she's recognizing this was God. And in some way, you know, in that in angelic form, that pre-incarnate form, she's not seeing the full glory of God that would blind her and, and you know, she couldn't live and survive. But therefore, because all this happened, the well where she was at is called Be'er, Be'er, sorry, Be'er Lahoy Roy. What that means, well, it, it tells where. It's between Kadesh and um, Barat. Okay, Kadesh is seven miles south of Hebron, Hebron. That's the southern Negev desert. It's the area where the people of Israel are going to wander for nearly 40 years before they enter Canaan under Yahshua. And Barad is believed to be a small town in the southern Negev. So on the map of Israel, go down south, go down into the desert area, get down to where they think Mount Sinai is. You're almost down to the end down there, um, headed for Egypt, very close to Egyptian border. That's the area where it happened. Now, Be'er Lahoy Roy means the well. Be'er, Be'er, B-E, apostrophe E-R in the Hebrew. That word means well. Okay, so it's the well of him who lives and sees me because that's what happened to Hagar. You are alive, God, and you do see me. Another one says it's called the well of the living one who sees me, whether it's the living one or whether it's he who sees me. The name of, of this well is giving credit to the credibility of this story. It was God who saw the well is belongs to the God who saw, who, who sees, and he is alive, he is alive, he's real, he's seeing me, that's what's being attested to in that name, it's a great name, it's basically a testimony to the God of Israel, the God of Israel is a live God, remember the Egyptians and all the others, the heathens, they're <laughs> worshiping stones, they're worshiping stone idols, I mean, wood carvings, they're worshiping dead, inanimate, you know, you pray to, and I'll say in today's vernacular, you pray to that stone Buddha, Buddha doesn't hear, Buddha doesn't see, Buddha doesn't answer, he has eyes, he has ears, they're carved onto that stone, <laughs> but prove to me that he sees, prove to me that he hears, and prove to me that he answers. And sadly, I've even seen these statues where they've literally brought food mm -hmm. and put it there for that statue to eat that food. Okay. Well, my God doesn't need me to feed him. He feeds me. <laughs> my God does hear. He does see. And Hagar had an encounter with the living God. And that's what this name of this well to this day in this area, in the southern Negev, we know where Yaakov's well is. I don't know exactly where this well is, but if they find this well exactly according to archaeological finds that fits this description, it needs to be called to this day, but Er Lahoy Roy, the living one who sees me. Hagar said it right. God's alive. And he's not just God up there, way out there, busy with creation, busy throwing stars out into space and busy creating who knows what else. No, that's the God who sees me, the God who hears me, the God who when I cry out to answers me. He met her where she was at, and it should have changed her forever. When we are crying out, when we are hurting, when you're wanting to say, God, do you hear me? God, did you forget me? God, and you can finish up with whatever you want to say. Let those words die before they get out of your lips. Don't do the Lord that disservice. He is the God who sees you. He is the God who hears you. He is the God who interacts with you. He is the God who is in the moment. And what's more? 
He had Hagar's life planned out. He had her son's life planned out. He told her, do you think he might have your life planned out? Mm -hmm. Do you think it might be worth staying in line and hearing him and following him? Do you think? <laughs> I'll let you answer that. <laughs> As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. You hear, you see, you interact, you are with us. And we will see, we'll pick up with our very last verse. We'll leave it for next week because it'll start and lead us into the next chapter. So we'll, we'll end with verse 15. We'll end on that positive note. Now, we haven't done 15 either. We'll end there, though. We're ending right where we're at. We're ending at the well. We're going to stay and feast on it for a week that God sees, God hears, God answers, and God cares. He cared about a little slave girl. He didn't say, why should I bother with you? I've got Avram. He's the one that, that you know, he's the big, the big guy, you know. No, God says, I see you. You may feel insignificant. You may not like your lot in life, but I see, and I hear, and I care, and my grace has sought you out. Amen. You have to come into my righteousness, but I love you so much that I did it all for you. I think of that all the time. God didn't leave any bit of it for us to have to do because we couldn't measure up to the first square. He did it all. He thought it all. He carried it all out. He completes it all. All we do is not rebel against it. Just open up to it and stay under his protection. Doesn't mean everything's perfect, but like I said, she was better off being a slave in the house of Avram, learning about the one true and living God, than she was being free in Egypt. Just the facts. Whatever you're fighting against and complaining against, ask God for his view. It might help you tolerate it a day longer. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Yes, Dosi, go ahead. I was just wondering, would she have got those beautiful blessings if she had not run away and stayed there? She could have, life could have continued to be better far longer than it will be for her. But rebelliousness and our attitudes and running with our own agendas will rob us of God's promises and blessings every time. Lord God, you are awesome. You are amazing. We so thank you that you are living. You are the alive God who hears and sees and answers. You are the God who's in control. You've got it planned out to literally to all of eternity and through eternity. And we just stand in awe. Lord, help us not to argue with you, not to for a moment rebel against what you have planned and ordained for us, but may we understand even if we don't like it even if we feel like we're slaves or, or whatever is, is discomforting to us may we realize you're working it for our best good that you will bring good out of it and that if we wait patiently upon you the blessings will more than make up for anything that we think we're suffering now thank you thank you for loving us so thank you for your patience with us thank you lord just thank you with a whole heart of praise and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 What we can learn that happened thousands of years ago. Is that not a mind blower too? <laughs> Relevant to today. That was good. It is good, isn't it? Isn't it? And yeah, comments, questions, open up your mics, add in. Your input is great. It makes it come alive for all of us, you know, more meaningful. So, have at it.